Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so I'll be talking about some work which uh, we did uh, several months ago with uh, Gautam Mandal and uh, Pranjal Naik. And uh, it's about the SYK model and uh, a proposal for a dual, which is a, is this? Ah, okay. So I was hoping that Chetan would actually review for you the SYK model. Now uh, he did not, and uh, so there is a little problem. So maybe I should get some more time, you know, because <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> All right, I'll go very fast, okay? So I'm sure everybody knows this model. So it's a model of uh, N Majorana fermions, uh, random Hamiltonian, uh, uh, Thus, and there are two important properties of this model. Why people are interested in studying it is that uh, in the large n limit and at strong coupling, there is an emergent reparameterization symmetry. It's almost there, it's not exact. And the uh, second point is that if you compute uh, some uh, out of time ordered correlators, uh, then this. Uh, <clears throat> There's a growing exponent over here with the very specific coefficients. And uh, uh, this uh, exponent is this uh, Lyapunov uh, chaos bound. And uh, the, this type of model saturates this bound. But of course, I mean, there are corrections of order one upon j beta at higher orders. But uh, to leading order, this saturates the chaos bound. And uh, it uh, leads to a new time scale in the problem, which is called the scrambling time, and which is so characteristic of black holes. So this is the reason why this uh, model became very important to study, because we are all interested in trying to understand black holes and all their conditions. Okay, so uh, as I said, <clears throat> this model is soluble in this limit, and uh, it's a good model to study holography or a duality, this model, which would be in one higher dimension under senses, and uh, black hole physics. Now, is that you average over and the large and Schwinger Dyson equations. Now, I can't explain any of these things because I just have an hour, and this is not even our work. So you'll bear with me that the large end limit can be sort of discussed in terms of two bilocal variables. And I'll be working throughout this talk in Euclidean time, unfortunately, but in Euclidean time where I know what I'm doing. Uh, <clears throat> so you have the Schwinger Dyson equations in large end limit, and they are given in terms of these uh, bilocal operators. And note that sigma is proportional to j square. And uh, the equations, then you need a certain It's not obvious that uh, the SYK or these tensor models at, uh, at uh, finite n actually uh, necessarily have this particular partition function. But that's a detail, important detail for the future, but I will not dwell on it. So this action over here, effective action, is just given by log determinant of some uh, <coughs> Fafian type of operator. And you have this term over here. So you minimize, you vary with respect to sigma and g, and back you get these equations. So, sorry? Yes, sorry. This should be q over here. That's what Lois said. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, because you have a g4 here also. Okay, fine. All right, good. So now this is the key observation of JF that uh, if uh, the frequency involved is uh, much less than this coupling J, <clears throat> or at finite temperature beta J is much greater than one, then the action and the Schwinger Dyson equations are invariant under this particular symmetry, which involves a function of tau, okay? So this is the emergent uh, reparameter symmetry which I talked about, and uh, clearly, uh, this symmetry immediately enables you to write down a solution for these bilocals, which is given by this uh, uh, formulas with a very specific exponent, because you have four fermions and the exponent is one fourth. Okay, the finite temperature, 
can be understood from this by making this type of conformal transformation or uh, reparameterization. And this is the answer. So all this is very well known. The key point over here for this solution is that uh, <clears throat> this uh, symmetry of time going to an arbitrary function of time, which I've called diff one, one referring to R1 or S1, is spontaneously broken to SL2R. And you can verify that these two solutions are invariant under SL2R. So you have spontaneous symmetry breaking of this large emergent symmetry by the solution of the problem. All right, so here is a picture. So uh, <clears throat> what you have basically is your uh, classical solution, and this is the orbit of diff one. And uh, clearly the action is uh, invariant under this, uh, is, is, is constant on this orbit, and that leads to a problem because if you integrate now over this uh, symmetry, you essentially encounter an infinity coming from the volume of this. And a more careful analysis of this problem, this is just a very heuristic way of thinking, actually leads to the same result that in the limit when beta j is really infinite, uh, this partition function is also infinite. <coughs> so, <coughs> all right, let me skip all this and go to the main point. So now, uh, in order to understand this model more carefully or calculate correctly, we need to solve the Schwinger Dyson equations for large values of beta j or j tau. <clears throat> so you have to resolve the problem and uh, go away from the, uh, you know, conformally invariant uh, point. And this is the solution which uh, Malasina, Stanford, and Kitayev came up with. And now if you use the solution, it doesn't have any of the problems which I mentioned before, and uh, you, what you're doing is basically taking the previous classical solution and, and computing corrections in 1 upon beta j or 1 upon tau j, and you have a new orbit of this new classical solution, and now you can do perturbation theory on this orbit, and uh, this leads to a well-defined uh, action for the low-lying modes, and uh, this action is the Schwarzian. So, uh, <laughs> So lots of steps, uh, the last one is uh, very difficult uh, uh, to do really to compute the correction to the solution away from the inform conformally invariant point by this irrelevant perturbation which is can be done and uh, the, uh, the collective coordinates essentially lead to this action which is this famous Schwarzschild action. <clears throat> And uh, it is this action which uh, sort of describes the low-lying modes of this model that uh, is responsible for this uh, chaos bound. What you do is basically you, uh, you compute a scattering of uh, two particles, take two particles and scatter them and you compute the exchange of this uh, quantum. Uh, it's, it's all worked out very nicely in Sena and Stanford's paper. And, uh, you essentially arrive at this result with a beta j. Beta j is large, n is large, and uh, this is the famous exponent. I have introduced h bar over here to emphasize that this is quantum chaos. A very, it's a completely a quantum mechanical effect. Okay, and similar conclusions can be drawn for the tensor models, which do not have disorder, which were dis discussed by Witten, Gurov, Klebanov. Talnopolsky and others. All right, so this is a very short summary of uh, these models. So to summarize, the SYK tensor models at large n and strong coupling are soluble. Unfortunately, not for finite n and weak coupling. And they exhibit chaotic behavior similar to a black hole and there's also the appearance of SL2R which uh, appears as you look at near horizon limits of charged black holes. So there's something here about black hole physics. Now, <clears throat> it's many years since we had a soluble model, and there was a whole uh, era in the 1990s and around that time uh, in which people focused a lot on the one matrix model uh, with, with the hope that you can understand black hole physics because the two-dimensional string theory does have a black hole. <clears throat> now, however, 
if you do the chaos diagnostics for the C equal to 1 matrix model, uh, it uh, does not exhibit chaotic behavior. In fact, it's, a, it's an integrable system of free fermions moving in a, uh, in a potential. And even though the bosonic representation looks very nonlinear, uh, clearly it has infinite number of conserved charges and you cannot produce this type of behavior. Okay, but on the other hand, it is exactly soluble for finite n. And hence, it is possible to illustrate how an exact non-local description goes over into an effective local formulation called collective field theory. We can also understand the Hilbert space of this exact gauge invariant non-local theory. And that is far richer than the effective local theory, which is called collective field theory. And this is, this is what Gautam was talking about in his uh, lecture. And uh, there's a whole development which was from long ago, but it very nicely makes connection. Uh, this connection I would like to thank Loga for. I asked to explain some of the papers of uh, <clears throat> recent times dealing with uh, quantum gravity. And uh, there are these papers by Bernstein, which basically uh, make the same point uh, in the context of these LLM geometries and what lessons we can learn for quantum gravity. So I, thinking about this now with my colleagues, I thought I'd just mention it in the spirit of these lectures. But now let me go over to more conventional, more sort of, by now, a little mundane for me <laughs> discussion. So, so the two things you can actually think of doing from here is try to understand the holographic dual to these models. And the other is, of course, as I already have emphasized here, we need to really understand the finite n and the nature of the Hilbert space of uh, these models which reproduce black hole properties uh, given the work of uh, Kiriakos and Surat and uh, Daniel Jafaris. Uh, these are all very intimately connected issues. And <clears throat> okay, the holographic dual now, so the talk will be about that. So there is a jakiv teitelbaum theory of a dilaton field, which simply multiplies the scalar curvature plus the negative cosmological constant. And only allowed geometries in this theory are essentially r equal to minus. OK, only those geometries are allowed. So Maldas and Stanford and Young have discussed this very this simple model in great detail. And they have, ab they have been able to reproduce uh, this action from the, uh, <clears throat> from the geometry, from the geometrical point of view. OK. Now we come to our work. Uh, but we had a different motivation. I think one of the things which people who want to understand ADS-CFT would like to do is that they would like to derive the ADS-CFT correspondence. You see, I mean. After all, we have just got so used to saying that there is a theory of gravity in one higher dimensions. Uh, but uh, all attempts to really give a derivation to the, of that have not succeeded. So we saw that there is some chance here to motivate at least a dual much more, uh, with much more conviction than that there is a dual based on some very ingenious understanding and then just verify it. So the motivation is the following. So I already mentioned that the SYK model has an emergent diff, S, diff 1 symmetry, which is broken to SL2R. <clears throat> now, immediately, uh, you moment you look at something like this, you're led to, if you have a certain history, led to uh, discussing how to quantize this type of model using the method of co-adjoint orbits a very well studied field. And uh, so therefore, I mean, I will not uh, detail much more the motivation, but you're led to the quantization of the co-adjoint orbit of uh, these corsets. And you're led to essentially looking at the loop group of uh, diff one. And there's a very well developed literature on this uh, model this idea that if you have this type of uh, co-adjoint orbit discussed by this type of symmetry algebra, 
then what is the, firstly the theory that you arrive at is in one higher dimension and it turns out to be Polyakov's two-dimensional gravity. And this is very well explained and worked out many years ago by Alexei and Shatashvili and Balram Rai and Rogers. Okay. The difference between S1 and R1 coming in the effective theory? The, uh, the fact that the time is compact or the time is... Uh, That's all. Yeah, Only. yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> okay, so once you arrive at here, you're encouraged now that uh, let's see what, what happens. So firstly, of course, uh, from our boundary physics, we know that uh, any solution of this theory should incorporate uh, ADS2, right? And we know that ADS2 can be naturally incorporated if you introduce a new uh, term, that is the volume term or the cosmological constant over here. And it should be such that uh, you get, a, you know, negative curvature tricks. You might also wonder whether this is unique that can I not add, because this is dimensionless in two dimensions, can I not add higher terms over here? And we worked out the consequence of the higher term, let's say for n equal to 2, 3. It's, it's, a, it's a fact of differential equations that uh, uh, you do not get a geometry which is asymptotically ADS2. So now we will work with this model. Yeah. By field and wait, 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 wait. Just not dilaton field, but just one minute. You're right. We will make it local in one, in one minute. Yeah. <clears throat> but this is what you get, so you learn to work with it first, lest you're going to make some mistakes or something. So here is our model. Uh, this is the cosmological constant term. This is the one that comes from the coed joint orbit uh, construction. And then, of course, we add boundary. So that the equations of motion that result from this action are real true saddle points. And the domain gamma over here is the right half Poincare plane over here. Xi is the coordinate here and tau is the Euclidean time. And the SYK model basically or its relatives live on this line over here. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> All this is very well defined, this inverse operator in the Euclidean metric is uh, very well defined. It's a studied object in mathematics, so there is no problem over here. All right, so this is our model. Now, let us see what we can do with it. So these are the equations of motion, rather ugly looking and highly non-local. But uh, one realizes that if you use this type of uh, decomposition of the metric, which is not unique up to wild transformations, the equations actually just collapse to something that looks very familiar to you, okay? All right, so this is the old Louisville equation, and these are the so-called constraint equations. <clears throat> so this is not Louisville theory, really, because this set of equations is very important, actually, for what we do. All right, so this is our model, and these are the equations, and... Uh, <clears throat> It's a Louisville type action, as I said. And now let us try to ask, given this model, what are the classical solutions? Because I would like to study the model in the limit when the Newton's coupling goes to zero. So you can use semi-classical method and look for classical solutions. So this problem has, uh, is a very complex set of classical solutions. Depending on the type of singularities you can admit in your theory. So for this discussion, I will only use very simple solutions to begin with. So the, let us look at the solution of this metric, parameterized thus, and choose g hat to be just ADS2, okay? Which is just the right half Moncare plane. And it's a choice. It's a choice of a regular good metric. Now if I use something else, because there's a classification of type of metrics we can use here, uh, <clears throat> but this is the simplest one I begin with. Okay, so, uh, and then I learned how to solve the Louisville equation, actually, uh, given this background. The, the trick is that, uh, I mean, this is a very well-known way of doing it. Uh, you get uh, the solution, the most general solution of the Louisville equation is given by this, where g of z is some holomorphic function. Okay, now what? But the phi must also satisfy these two constraints. And if I substitute this solution, into these constraints, 
then this function g of z, which looked very arbitrary, must satisfy these two equations, that the Schwarzschild must vanish, or specifically g of z is just a linear transformation like this, where a, b, c, d are complex numbers. Okay? Now, now amongst this six parameter family, <clears throat> is it, yes, uh, there are those which just do not change the boundary. You see the boundary of the right half Poincare plane was z plus z bar equal to zero, okay? Now, I want to mod out by those transformations which do not change the boundary. That means which leave g of z plus g bar of z bar equal to zero again. Since this is zero, this must also be zero. And those are precisely your SL2R transformations. They don't change the boundary. So we are looking for those parameters precisely those transformations which slightly shift the boundary. And therefore you do have a three parameter set that does that, okay, because uh, six minus three is three. Okay. So, <clears throat> therefore, I now look for small deformations of ADS2, which are called nearly ADS2. And uh, you simply linearize around uh, one, that is the identity. And uh, all you do is basically you can arrive at a solution for phi, which is given by delta G tau. I'll explain what this is. This, uh, this parameter this coordinate xi, and delta g tau is essentially in general given by this. But I would like to even simplify my problem by just saying that I'm looking at just a shift of uh, this coordinate z, and if I do that, I arrive at a solution for the conformal mode, which is just a constant divided by xi. And I want it to be small, because, and how do I arrange that? Because you see, in all this business, the, the subtle computational problem is that you have to work with a fixed cutoff. And uh, I impose this cutoff in an ADS2 trick, and this is what it is. And uh, I would like to require my parameter delta g to be such that it satisfies this uh, inequality. It cannot be too large. So that at psi equal to uh, delta, this is really small at the cutoff. Okay, so therefore, I have produced for you a solution of the equations of motion, which is a deformation of ADS2. Recall that uh, in the SYK model, you had a solution at the conformally invariant point, and I had to, I had to do a perturbation theory of the, of the equations of motion to generate a solution which is corrected by powers of one upon j beta. So this is exact analog of that in the bulk theory. Can I think of this as promoting the cutoff to a field? No, I'm, I'm not doing it that way. I am saying that my understanding of quantum gravity is that you need, need to define the cutoff with respect to a fixed metric. That's holy for me, at least uh, here. There may be a way of doing it, but I don't know. Yeah. Thing in terms of field theory. Shall I? Okay. So now let us look at the second part of the solution. So this was the exponential of two phi part, now the g hat part. So now let us try to understand or look at the solutions which correspond to almost ADS2. So this is uh, more subtle than, uh, it, uh, than the previous part. And uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, this discussion cannot really be done in conformal gauge. So there are subtleties about fixing conformal gauge in a two-dimensional theory of gravity with boundaries. And they have been discussed at some detail in Polyakov's book on uh, string theory, gauge theories, etc. So <clears throat> let us first uh, say that the metric components should fall off as such. Okay, g xi xi, g xi tau, and g tau tau. And note here, g xi tau is of order one. It's the non -di off, off diagonal component. The second point is, let us try to make diffeomorphisms of this uh, metric, <clears throat> and try to ask uh, 
which diffeomorphisms preserve this type of fall off. This is all mimicking uh, the classic work of Brown and Heno. But clearly, you have to fix a gauge before you can answer this question. And that is the Pfeffer and Graham gauge. And once you do that, you have unambiguous solutions. And uh, the solution for the killing, asymptotic killing vectors is precisely given by xi times delta f. This is not that other delta. This is small f. And this is small f minus this part. And you can check very easily that if you make this uh, diffeomorphism, the boundary of the right half Poincare plane, that is xi equal to 0, maps into xi equal to 0. OK, so that's nice. <clears throat> and this is the finite transformations. So the finite transformations were obtained by understanding similar things in ADS3. So somehow one used ADS3, knowledge of ADS3, and uh, <clears throat> where these finite transformations are known, uh, strict them to a plane, and all said and done, you can actually integrate those uh, infinitesimal transformations to these uh, finite form. And so now uh, you have this metric. This is ADS2 in coordinates xi twiddle and tau twiddle. And I make this large diffeomorphism. And the metric turns out to be this one. And uh, you can see over here that the Schwarzschild has appeared in this whole class of metrics. Uh, so we have an orbit of ADS2 by this large diffeomorphisms is by this function f of tau, which uh, is such that f prime is non-zero. In fact, we should choose it positive. OK, now this question about the cutoff. So uh, in ADS2, I had a certain cutoff, right? At uh, xi twiddle equal to delta. So what happens to this cutoff, actually? So it wanders under this transformation. And uh, the wandering is basically given by this simple picture that in the xi tau coordinates, this is how the cutoff looks, really. So this is how the boundary of ADS2 maps into the boundary of almost ADS2. So in summary, summarizing these last few slides, in the limit b square going to 0, the classical geometries which I admit over here uh, <clears throat> are given by this box over here. So you have e to the 2 phi, uh, ds hat square, and uh, these are the solutions, basically, OK? So uh, this is the solution of our, uh, the classical solutions of our model. And uh, now what do you do with that? So you want to compute the classical action and the boundary part of the classical action. So this is a very long and tedious uh, type of computation. So all I will do is. Uh, it's not only tedious, but it's actually very, it's, it's, it's quite tricky. Precisely because uh, if you're not very careful about counter terms and all, you get divergent answers, basically, as delta goes to zero. So I'm sure people who know this subject are familiar with the difficulties over here. So anyway, uh, so the, if you take the uh, excess of the bulk action along this orbit over the ADS2, then this excess is just given by this formula. And if you impose the appropriate boundary conditions on the uh, reparameterizations near the identity, uh, which is a very reasonable thing to do, then this just vanishes. And uh, the only contribution that you really have is from the boundary. And this contribution turns out to be this version of f twiddle and uh, <clears throat> times delta g. And I have chosen delta g to be a constant. So in a sense, this is our main result, uh, that the two-dimensional quantum gravity path integral, now you will be integrating over these uh, symmetry modes uh, with this action over here. And our constant over here is delta g upon b square. It is no brain that uh, to make the DSCFT correspond matching, delta g will be like 1 upon j. And remember, j was large. We are strongly coupled, so delta g is small. And b square is uh, 1 upon n, which is like the small Newton's coupling. <clears throat> and uh, you can uh, firstly, of course, uh, the, this integral has been exactly calculated by Witten and uh, uh, Douglas Stanford. That's a very beautiful result, but I will not go into it, uh, in which this coefficient can be of arbitrary size, OK? 
in this problem, uh, delta G is, uh, and beta squ uh, B square are such that this object is small. How much time do I have? Zero. So I'll, I'll, since we invented negative numbers in this country, I'll take <laughs> a little bit, just two minutes. Okay, so uh, we can compute the uh, free energy and find uh, the agreement with the SYK model up to some non-universal terms that the uh, free energy also goes proportional to the temperature over here. So that's reasonable, and this is the summary. Uh, <clears throat> so the two-dimensional gravity dual, which is naturally motivated by the infrared Virasoro symmetry, correctly accounts for the hydrodynamic Schwarzschild action. And around smooth ADS2 and AADS2 geometries, the only degree of freedom is the boundary, that is this uh, diffuse generated by this F of tau. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is what we could do. Uh, in the future, it would be interesting to understand uh, these uh, operators, which correspond to the other part of the, 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 more, the, the uh, more massive spectrum of the SYK model, and try to understand the dual framework. And it's very likely that this, these operators so singular geometries in the bulk. And nice thing about our model, as opposed to Jakiv Teitelboim, is that uh, <clears throat> I think uh, our geometries are just not restricted only to negative curvature geometries, okay? The other last point I want to make is that uh, there is a SL2R current algebra formulation of uh, the two-dimensional gravity due to Polyakov. And uh, there is a possibility that uh, we may be able to solve our model in some exact way, there's just a possibility, and also be able to then reproduce the spectrum and go beyond the semi-classical approximation and try to understand the full Hilbert space of this problem. Okay, thank you. See, at the moment, both proposals reproduce the Schwarzschild, yeah. okay? Uh, the difference here is that our model is more rich, I think, because it can also include more complicated singular geometries, okay? So this is all I could say at the moment, So yeah. would these have finite action, the other geometries? I mean, uh, then would they contribute as other sub Saddles or something like that uh, in the Possibly, actually. So I, I was just thinking that if you introduce these operators as sources near the boundary, then you will have to solve these equations of motion with uh, some uh, singularities. And there are solutions of this theory with singularity. But would they have finite action? I don't know that, actually. I, I don't know that, right. Maybe we'll have to do some subtraction, etc. I don't know that. But it has the the tenets in it for some further work actually, yeah.